So the number one thing that we can also understand in addition to all this stuff about learning uh, is that the prefrontal cortex is really important for active maintenance. And this is uh, one example of recording from Summer and Wurtz. Uh, and they have here a, a classic kind of example of a oculomotor delayed response task. Basically, you have monkeys staring at a fixation point and then a little flash comes off to the screen on one side and they have to wait and during that delay um, before they can move their eyes over there um, you get neurons coding for that location of the target that they're then going to look at and that momentary kind of maintenance of information over time is uh, what we think of as active maintenance people call it working memory people call it short-term memory um, it is something that is very much associated with the prefrontal cortex and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the special mechanisms involved. Uh, and, but in any case, you can really clearly see a sustained, uh, what we call delay period activity, a sustained firing of neurons in the prefrontal cortex during that delay period that are specifically holding on to the exact location that you're supposed to saccade to. And again, these are kind of these histograms. Each row is a trial and this kind of summed line down here is showing the overall kind of increase in activity during this delay period. And very interestingly, almost inevitably, you see that these maintenance neurons, which continue to fire during the whole delay period, um, will turn off very uh, fast and, and kind of in a very punctate manner um, for the uh, when the action that they're holding on to and they're supporting is actually taken. And that's actually turns out to be one of the bigger mysteries uh, that we're still working on is how do they know when you've used the information? Seems kind of maybe easy, but it actually is a little bit challenging when you talk about the neurons. You also see neurons in prefrontal cortex that respond to phasic stimuli, uh, neurons that respond to, or that are active at the time of mo uh, movement. These are kind of classic kind of motor initiation uh, neurons that you would expo expect to see uh, in a motor system. Uh, and so the prefrontal cortex is kind of the highest level of the motor system and we think of it as kind of initiating these motor actions based on these maintained active traces in there. Assume for the moment that the prefrontal cortex has this special ability for active maintenance. You can actually use that to understand all of the things that the prefrontal cortex does. The ability to uh, control or do this kind of top-down biasing depends, as we mentioned, on this ability to hold on to and kind of sustain this clear, consistent task representation saying, this is what we should do, this is what we should do, this is what we should do. So when your brain goes to sleep and that is when actually your prefrontal cortex is least active, uh, it's most differentially deactivated during sleep, and you get this signature you know, phenomenon during dreaming of completely uncoordinated behavior, just rambling kind of uh, stream of consciousness, drifting thoughts uh, with no consistency over time. So that really gives you this window into this idea that the, the prefrontal cortex is this strict taskmaster pointing and, 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 and focusing your attention, your top-down attention on the task at hand. Some of us have better prefrontal cortex than others. <laughs> I tend to get a little bit rambly myself, uh, even when I'm awake. If you think about planning as another thing that the prefrontal cortex does, this ability to uh, actively hold on to information in this kind of active firing state of neurons is critical for being able to represent things that aren't there in the future that you're thinking about and, and kind of juggle these possible futures and think about, well, if I did this, then this would happen. If I did this, this would happen. Um, this gets discussed a lot these days in the context of a kind of mental model, model-based uh, reinforcement learning is a term that people use. This ability to think about possible futures and select kind of actions that lead to a good possible future. Active maintenance is also critical for motivation. Again, this very closely tied with cognitive control, but uh, also this ability to kind of hold, not only hold on to a goal, but kind of monitor incrementally as uh, your behavior is unfolding and as things are unfolding in the world, uh, your progress towards these goals that requires a kind of not only a maintenance, but also a kind of ability to integrate information over time. Reward processing, again, notions of maintaining different possible outcomes that you might be 
expecting and the degree to which you're expecting those different outcomes. And as we saw in uh, the motor chapter, your dopamine response is uh, proportional to the kind of degree of surprise or lack of expectation of these outcomes. And so maintaining a representation in active maintenance mode of active memory of these different possible outcomes is also really important. And so we think that, for example, the orbital frontal cortex is very important for this. And then finally, uh, decision making really is more of this kind of same process of planning, uh, thinking about, well, if I did this, this is the kind of outcome that would, uh, I would get. And so kind of evaluating the different possible choices, um, very much like planning, requires this kind of core maintenance ability. This is just a crazy kind of example of a stream of consciousness text that I found by Googling stream of consciousness text. Um, in any case, this notion, as we just said, about the prefrontal cortex being deactivated during dreaming uh, and, and this kind of subjective experience that we've all had where you, know, you just can't keep track of stuff. That gives us this real clear window into what the prefrontal cortex is doing. Okay, another real clear window into what the prefrontal cortex is doing comes from the Stroop task. And this is one of the most widely studied tasks in all of cognitive psychology, uh, invented in the 30s, I think, by this guy named Stroop. Um, and uh, it's a really good demonstration, very reliable, very replicable of what top-down biasing kind of amounts to in a very simple, easily studied lab task. So here we have a word. I want you to say not the word, but actually the color uh, we say the ink color, but it's actually the pixel color um, that the uh, uh, word is uh, rendered in. Okay, so here we would say red, that's convenient. Here we would say green. Oops, I really, really want to say red, right? <laughs> I just want to say red, but I actually should say green, okay? Um, and that's where you get tripped up. This is the Stroop effect. It's when you have this kind of conflict between a well-practiced uh, pathway like reading that's conflicting with this kind of strange thing of like, well, I don't really go around naming the colors, especially the colors that, that words are printed in uh, that much. Maybe I did when I was a kid, but as adults, you know, we spend most of our time just reading stuff. Um, and so that pathway of reading is really strong and this other pathway is very weak. And so we have to kind of really focus and sometimes we would just blurt out red instead of saying green. Or in other cases, if we get it right, we still take a little bit of extra time to process that. Of course, you have the other example. You'd want to say green again. You should say red. So you see here this classic uh, pattern from Dunbar and McLeod, um, where there's a significant slowing in particularly this conflict case. So this is red written in green ink or vice versa. Um, and uh, people just slow down like that's a massive effect that's several hundred milliseconds of, of delay of slowing um, you get a small facilitation if in fact you get red written in red ink uh, and so that's what we're seeing relative to this you know uh, control condition which would be just the word red written in black ink for example what also you notice here is that when you're asked in the other condition of the Stroop task to just actually read the word um, which you again do kind of habitually automatically, um, you have almost no effect of the ink color. So it's just like, regardless, you just kind of blow right through it. Um, and so that asymmetric uh, effect, the asymmetry between color naming and word reading is also another key signature of the Stroop task.